Well, if you have your Bibles, let's go to Genesis 1. We're doing a study. As we come to Moody, we're doing a study out of the book of Genesis. We're going to look at the creation story first. And we are in, today we're in a lesson 11, and we start the first day. We spend a little time between verse 1 and 2. But today we're in day 1, verses 3, 4, and 5. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Why do you think that God started with that? I mean, he could start with anything he wants because he's God, right? And he's doing creation, but he begins with light. He could have begun with anything, agreed, because we got seven days, and we don't know how they all ran. Six days of creation, a day of rest. You know, me, I'd have took my day of rest first, but then... God has a different system on that. But it's important, the chronological order of creation. And the chron chronological order of creation is based on verse 2. Look at verse 2. The earth was formless and void, that's tohu wabohu, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving or hovering, as the King James used to say, over the surface of the waters. Hmm? And we know that darkness, in verse 2, is based on the fall of Satan, because he is all about the darkness. I mean... His domain on earth is called darkness. It's the domain of darkness, Colossians 1.13. And everybody is born into that. You have to be born again to get into the kingdom of light of the beloved Son. Because what you have as a picture is you have a little circle. It's called the earth. Another circle around that earth is darkness, and another circle around that earth is water. In Job 27, that's become ice. And around that is the Holy Spirit. That's verse 2. Earth, wrapped in darkness, wrapped in water, wrapped by the Holy Spirit, which is a preserver and a protector. You understand that? Well, you, well we spent 11 lessons on this. You're a, if you're just visiting with us or just getting into this, you're, this is our 11th lesson before we got to verse 3. All in preparation. We've studied the Eternal Life Conference, and we've studied the fall of Satan, We've talked about how darkness is affected. But anyhow, so here I am. What's the first thing God does? What, what is day one all about? Here it is. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. Where did darkness come from? Verse 2. Right? Right? Yeah. Right? So the first thing he's going to deal with is darkness. And listen to me. That light that is started in day one is going to go day one, two, and three. Day one, day two, day three. Before we get to the solar system, this light is not the solar system. You don't get to a solar system until day four. We're going to talk about that light today. The light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. The light of verse one from the darkness of verse two is day one of creation. God called, this is vocabulary, when you say God called, and he's dealing with days or numbers or events, it's divine vocabulary, 
of the Word of God. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. That's the first set of divine vocabulary from the Word of God. You got it? Huh? He called the day what? He called the light what? He called the darkness. And there was evening, and there was morning. Watch this now. One day. That's a cardinal number. A cardinal number. That's like one, two, three, four. Rather than first, second, and third. The only day he did that was on day one. After that is called the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. It's really important Hebrew. Now we've got another set of, of vocabulary. Watch this now. We've got another set. He called, the, he called the light day. He called the darkness night. There was evening. What does that go with? Darkness. And there was morning. What's that go with? Light. He's got two sets of vocabulary. You see that? It could be a gate question. That's the reason I'm telling you. See? And all my people are going to get in because they know, right? And so we got, it does it one, one day. Now remember, day one, day two, and day three is not working off a solar system. Let's have a word of prayer because we're going to need it, all right, to get this down. So let's pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. The awesome privilege to confess sin if necessary because of the work of Christ on the cross extended to the Christian life. He confesses his sin to be restored to fellowship, not salvation, but to fellowship under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Mental attitude, sins, sins of the tongue, and avert sins should be confessed according to 1 John 1, 9. If we, it maybe we will, maybe we won't, but here's what's important. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is there, John 14, 26, to teach and recall. When you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. That cleansing is the blood of Christ working on behalf of the Christian, not for salvation, but for sanctification. Experiential sanctification. How wonderful that is. Thank you, Father for your marvelous work from the cross. But here we are in the beginning of restoration of creation. What happened between verse 1 and verse 2 is the fall of Satan. And darkness is identified with him through the rest of the Bible. And light is now identified with you, Father, through the rest of the Bible. In fact, one of the most interesting parts of this is John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of God to the world. He's talking about this very light that we're talking about in day one. Or as you said, Father, one day. We are so thankful to have the word of God and divine vocabulary that controls our life has now been canonized into what is called the Word of God or the Bible. We're so thankful for it. May we have happy hearts about studying the Word of God because we have answers to the questions that mankind have the questions without the answers. Because they won't study the Word of God. But as students of the Word of God, we are excited about what you will teach us today about this day one. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is our 11th lesson, as I mentioned on our paper, uh, covering Genesis 1, 1 through 5. 
And what you learn in the creation story sets up the rest of the Bible. The doctrines that are taught out of the creation story, without it, you have no foundation for the rest of the Bible. With it, you have, this is the reason I have stopped. I have walked really slowly. I'll probably never go back through Genesis with you. I have really walked slow through the book of Genesis to give you the doctrines that are really important to stabilize you in your divine thinking of the rest of the book of the Bible. It's very important. Today, we look at day one of the restoration of creation that's recorded in Genesis 1, 3 through 5. I've entitled our lesson, Separation of the Light from the Darkness of Genesis 1-2. Leah, in his commentary on the science aspect of this, looking at science and how they view the creation story, he remarks in his commentary, science has discovered that light is not conditioned by perfected humilary, uh, uh, luminary bodies but that light bodies are conditioned of a preceding luminous element. And boy, is he right. He just looked at that from a science standpoint and says, the light that we have is conditioned off from something that existed prior to it. For example, the solar system. You know what existed before the solar system? Day one, two, and three, light. The light of day one, two, and three is different, absolutely, completely different than the solar system on day four, five, and six. In fact, they are so different that the people who study the Bible as a principle of knowledge call these first three days the days of God. Because you don't have a system like we have rotating and doing all of that stuff. These days are uniquely different. And I'm going to tell you why it's so important to your life to know that before today is over. Paul referred to this luminous light element as the unapproachable light of God. He addressed this very subject matter in 1 Timothy 6.16. He addressed this very issue. Listen to what Paul wrote. God, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, that's what we're talking about in day 1, 2, and 3, who man, it should say, has not seen. The word not is not there. Who man has not seen, or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. This light, this un unapproachable light, who is God, is what they're talking about. And it represents the eternal dominion of God. Eternal, see? Remember that in Genesis 1-2, the light of God was absent. In verse 2, the light of God is absent because what dominate, what circles the earth? Darkness. 1 John 1-5 is a principle about God. In 1 John 1-5, it says, God is light... And in him, there is no darkness. 1 John 1, 5. You got that? That's an easy verse to remember, is it not? God is light. And the light we're talking about is not, the, not like the solar light. It's a light element, a luminous element that is associated with God and is eternal. You know, your solar system is going to go away. You do know that. Well, let's, let's, let's beat all the other people out there that wouldn't believe that. They go, well, it's all dying and probably on our watch and everything. Study the Bible. It's, 
tells you the front to the back on it. First John 1 5. You want to remember first John 1 5. God is light. To him there is no darkness. Now let me give you five ideas in the first hour, and then we'll come back the second hour and deal more. The light of day one, two, and three are functioning as the special days of God. Genesis 1, 1 through 13. Actually, it should be 31. <laughs> you always pay attention to my numbers, don't you? Correct that. It's not 3 through 13. It's, three, three th it's the whole creation story. During the first three days of the, of the restoration, well, actually, 13 would be all right because of four, the verse 14, it would be okay. But in verses 14 through 19, you have the fourth day, which is the solar system. So you can leave it if you want to. I looked at it, and I went, ah, I did it again. But it's, I actually did it right. And so he's doing it wrong. I just assumed I did it. During the first three days of the restoration of creation, the light of God system, the light of God system functioned for the earth before the solar system of day four, 14 through 19. It was separating the darkness of Satan's uh, work from the light of God. And listen to what's important. Write this on your paper. What God, what, God just was, what God did in day one established boundaries. There are light boundaries and there are darkness boundaries. You understand that? Or, or domains. Hold your place in Genesis and go with me. Just again, you're familiar with this, but Colossians 1.13, and you can see it working in our day, this idea of boundaries of light and darkness. In Colossians 1.13, we use this passage a lot to talk about salvation. Here's, a, here's verse 13. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. See that? Look. Domain and kingdom are boundaries. You understand that? Satan has a dominion of darkness. God has a kingdom of light. You understand that? Where, did that, where was that established? Day one. Oh, well. <laughs> okay. All right. The separating of the darkness of Satan from God's light, the light of God, is establishing, what he's doing is he's establishing boundaries of darkness and light. All right? It is interesting that the light of God of day one, two, and three, which in the Hebrew would say day one, the second day and the third day, because after we have day one, we go, sec we go into ordinal numbers. We go second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. I'll talk about the second hour. It is interesting that the days... One, two, and three are consecrated elements or substance of God's light that separated the darkness. Where, what did God, how did God do that? I mean, how, does, how did God separate the darkness off? How did he separate it out and put boundaries around it? That's what I just explained to you. He, listen, listen what God did. God said, let there be light. And what? Light. And there was light. And the power of the element of God's light, the power, the luminous power of God's character separated the darkness from the light and put boundaries around them so that we have domains. Are you with me? Well, I just showed it. All right, let's go to the book of Acts. Ellison, I don't mind. All I got, 
I'm just here to teach till you get hungry and we go home. It don't mind. I don't hold you all day until somebody falls out of the window and dies. So you know, there's some things to be thankful for. I'm, I'm looking at Acts 26. I'm going to verse 18. Watch what he says. I'm just trying to show you how, how did we get the domain of darkness and the domain of light? We got day one. Listen to this. To open the light, so, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the domain of Satan to the domain of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me, Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Domains. Where did they come? Where did, I mean, where did Acts 26, 18 come from? Day one. Aren't you glad you came today? Aren't you glad you came today? And when you believe the gospel of Christ, the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, Romans 1.16. God reaches over by his sovereign grace and rescues you out of the domain of darkness and transfers you in the, into the kingdom of the beloved Son, which is light. That was Colossians 1.13. Isn't that wonderful? You didn't have to climb your way out. You couldn't have. These are boundaries that were set by God. You can't. Listen, God determines who's in it and who's out of it. You're born into the domain of darkness, and you have to be born again to get into the domain of light. You see, these boundaries have spiritual connotations, don't they? I mean, these are literal these are going to be, these are literal domains on day one. This is creation story of restoration. And these were actual plays. These were, this was actual. This is day one. And we have vocabulary connected to it, right? That's used universally. <laughs> I meet unbelievers. I don't believe in God. I don't think there's a God. I think man made it up. Well, let me tell you something. Most of your vocabulary comes from God. Day one, day two, day three, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Who doesn't call? Who doesn't think it's daylight saving time? It's evening and time to go to bed. Who doesn't talk that way? Well, I don't know they talk that way, but who doesn't think that way? Where does that vocabulary come from? <laughs> I just found it. Right? Daylight, evening, night. This is morning, this is evening. Where does that come from? The Bible. Divine vocabulary. Man didn't think it up. Man's not smart enough to think this stuff up. Who's that smart? I don't know. I am not. Point number two. So we got established boundaries, right? And where to come from? The power of God. Light. God spoke light and has separated and created boundaries. They're still there and will be there to the end of human history. Day one, two, and three is eternal. The book of Revelation says it's eternal. Day one is eternal. The light on day one is eternal. And if you read through the Bible... you will find the book of Revelation talks about that. I'm going to talk about it today if I get to it. Point number two, I will get to it today or now or later. Right? Point number two, note that the three things that God did to separate light from darkness, 
Now, he's going to do four things on day one. But three of these have to do with separating light and darkness and creating the domains. Are you with me? Okay. Okay. Watch. God spoke, God saw, and God separated. The first thing God did was he spoke light into the restoration of creation on day one. God said, that's a cal and perfect in Hebrew, God said, let there be light, and there was light. The second thing God did, God saw ra'ah, cal, imperfect. God saw that the light was what? Wait, based on whose character did he say it's good? Guys, don't... You got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and all the characters are good, and that's, the only per, right, that, that's what we're dealing with. All right? God saw that the light, God saw that the light was good. That's divine good. All right? It's based on the character of God. The word good connected with light is based on the character of God. Write these down. Write this down. Psalms 106, verse 1, and Psalms 136, verse 1. Our song this morning, aptly picked, was about praise God. This psalm says that. Psalms 106, 1 says, as the other, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. You know, when I was a little boy, we used to pray this rope prayer. God is good. Let him thank for our food, that business. Remember, now I lay me down to sleep and all that business. Remember those prayers? I don't know. God is good. We should, oh, give thanks. This, this is a Psalms of praise. We should praise him. Oh, give thanks or praise God for he is good. Right? He creates good. Listen to me. If you think that God saved you for you to be good on your own character and qualities, you're wrong. Because the standard God set comes from Him. If you want to be good, as God is good, you're going to have to go to the power of God to get it. You're going to have to go to the third member of the Godhead who produces within you divine good. Come on now. This good he's talking about comes from the divine character of God, doesn't come from the human character of man. Now, man could do good, but it's not divine. Do you understand that? Only God can produce good. How does he produce it in my life as a Christian? Through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead does good. Okay. Just, what he saw was a cal and perfect. Now watch this. The third thing he does is really interesting. When he gets to separation, because that's the big deal in, in day one, is separation of light and darkness. Listen to me. Th this word is badal in the Hebrew. Watch this now. It's a hip field. It's hip field. We've had cal and perfect. We've had cal and perfect. And all of a sudden, we get a Hephel imperfect. In the Hephel, in the Hebrew, H-I-P-H-I-L, Hephel, H-I-P-H-I-L, if you're interested, is causative. It always points to a cause. It's causative. The Hephel is causative. The word separated, God separated, God and God alone was the cause of separating the light from the darkness. It was in his own character of light 
that he spoke light into existence, and in that powerful moment, the element of light that God is came out and separated them and created boundaries for them for human history. Is that not something? Is he not an awesome God? Why would you not trust him with your petty stuff? I mean, this is big time stuff here, isn't it? And yet God approaches each of our life as as important as this day one is in his life. The things going on in your life is just as important to God as this is. And you need the divine power of God to settle those issues in your life. And he's more than willing to do it. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. What is the word set? What is the word set? Separated? It's a what? It's a hip field. It's a hip field. Right? Listen to 1 Thessalonians 5.5. 5. Write this on your paper. 1 Thessalonians 5.5. 5. But I want to encourage your hearts. This is what Paul says about this. For you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. Where did he get that idea? <laughs> he got it from day one of Genesis where God separated the dominion and those who are in it are identified by it. Right? You have a domain, a, a do, a domain of darkness and a domain of light, right? Depending on what domain you're in. How do I get into the domain of light? Th through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Once I'm in the kingdom of the beloved son, I become whoever he is, right? He's a son, I'm a son. He's an heir, I'm an heir. He has inheritance, I have that inheritance. Eternal life, eternal life, yada, 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 the 20 status privileges that every believer has because God is good. You are all, not some of you, you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. Where did that idea come from? It came from Genesis, the first day of creation. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. Where'd that vocabulary come from? Da 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 da. That's where it came from. That's listen. Just like Colossians one thirteen, just like Acts twenty six eighteen. Here's First Thessalonians five five. Aren't you glad you came to church today? My my. Here's one. Write this down. See, I'm trying to bring you into day one. Because the gospel has done that for you. Read, read. He brought you, watch this. Ephesians 5, 8, and 9. Write that down. I'm going to read it to you. You were formerly darkness. That's every human being. Born into the domain of darkness through Adam's sin. You were formerly darkness, but now, da 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 da, now, you are light in the Lord. Why? John 8, 12. Jesus is the light of the world. Those that in Christ are sons of light. He's the son of light. In Christ, you're a son of light. It's one of the 20 status privileges. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of this light consists of goodness, righteousness, and truth. Just think of that. All that, a gift from God on day one, when he separated the light from the darkness. And you had the good sense to believe the gospel that Christ died on that cross for your sins was buried and raised from the dead in order to put you into the kingdom of the beloved son of light by grace and not by yourself. It was a gift, not of works. The boast and the praise goes to the, to the Lord. Point number three. The fourth and final thing that God did on day one was to teach vocabulary of the Word of God. <laughs> it's the Word called. 
God called the light day and morning. God taught divine vocabulary of the Word of God. He put them in two sets. It is recorded by Moses. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning. Now, we, we don't get to say how many hours in each until we get to the solar system. Agreed? Yes. Okay. So you don't have to wear your watch until then. All right? Because we're not in it. All right? Remember, remember that this was done, the light of day one, two, and three is before a solar system. Agreed? I mean, you can agree or not agree. It depends on whether you read ahead. Note that day one vocabulary words identify the separation of God's light from Satan's darkness. Agreed? I mean, that should be a given by now. I gave you so many scriptures. Right? You wrote them down, didn't you? I said, write these scriptures down. You wrote them, right? Don't make Pam come up and check your papers now. <laughs> right? But I'm going to send Pam around. The teacher will come out of her, and she'll give you that look if they're not right. You know, it, I wonder how long you have to be a teacher to get that look. Every teacher has that look. If you have not, every kid who's been in class knows that teacher look. I did, I've often wondered, I'll have to ask Terry, how long did it take you to get that look? Just Mary and Billy did it? Huh? Mary and Billy. <laughs> Before she started school, I mean, she had that look. And marriage will do it. If, if school doesn't, marriage will. It, here's my fourth point. On day one, God introduces us to the importance of divine vocabulary of the Word of God. I put down the soul to give you a reminder. Who are you actually in your soul? You have self-consciousness, awareness of your own existence in God. You have a conscience that holds you to a standard of right and wrong. Scripturally is the best way to have it. You have a mentality which we're really interested because, listen, God took in consideration when he gave you vocabulary that he was going to give you a mind. <laughs> eh? We ain't got a man yet. We ain't got a man and a woman yet. But we do have a mind. We do have a mind. The mentality of the soul is anticipated in day one when he gave you vocabulary words. And, and God wonderful. See, God's always a step of where you are. You think you're failing. You think you're never going to be able to get back up. You think that nothing could be worse than the day you're in. Right? God has all that stuff covered for you. You know that. I don't care what you're going through. You don't have to go through it alone. And the one who allowed it to be set up in your life is the one who will walk you out of it, and you'll be glad for it. You'll look back and say, I don't ever want to do that again. But God is miraculous. What God just did in my life, what God just did in my life takes my breath away. Hmm? I won't go through that again. But if I do, I want to be sure that I have God walk me out. I mean, we may have that furnace that we're thrown into to test us. You know what I mean? Are you ready for it? Because the one who protected you outside the furnace is the one who protects you inside the furnace. And he has awesome powers. He can separate the light from the darkness. Hmm. Do you know that? See, God, in day one, when he gave vocabulary of the word of God, anticipated your mentality and the cycling of the word of God through faith. Just think of that. 
God is so far out ahead of us. So we have the faith cycle. We talk about, so faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. We talk about believing that. Out of Hebrews 4.2, For indeed, we have had good news preached to us just as others also, but the word they heard didn't profit them because they didn't unite what they heard by faith. We are told, now we are able, having heard it and believed it, we are now able to walk it out of our life by faith and not by sight. We don't have to live in this world by sight. We can live it by faith because you'll live it one way or the other. You're either going to deal with your problems by faith or you're going to deal with them by sight. And sight is a boomerang. You know boomerang? 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And watch the final step of the faith cycle and being fully assured. Where does that come from? It comes from hearing the word, believing the word, and willingness to walk it out in your life, not knowing anything other than that God has it in your life. God always has it. He always has it. And walking it out by faith means you have to rest your faith in him to walk it out. you got to rest it. you got to say, okay, no, you know, I've, I've, I want to get my hands in the midst of all this, Father, but I know it's in your hands, right? Do you, do you believe that? John 10, do you believe John 10, 28 through 30? Do you believe that? Being fully assured, see, is very important, isn't it? Because there's always, always a little waiting period called the faith rest place where you have, to, you have to do the Psalms 27. You have to wait on the Lord. And that interesting, wait on the Lord. You may have to wait on your wife, but wait on the Lord? What does that mean? He tells you for him to do what he said he would do. Romans 4.21. Romans 4.21. Listen to hear what it says. I wrote it down. And being fully assured. That's it. We call that confidence. And being fully assured that what he had promised, what God had said he would do, he is able to do or perform. And when he does that, he'll do it in such a way that you can praise nobody but him. There's not going to be any wiggle room in that stuff. Well, it was probably God and. No, it was God. It was God. <laughs> it was God. That's the faith cycle. I just walked you through the faith cycle. Let me close. Let me close out the morning session. Okay? We'll have a little break. We'll have the offering. We'll take a break, and then we'll come back for the second session. Well, I, ho I hope I can get through this. Five. Divine vocation, watch this now. <sighs> I get so tired of relative, relativism, relativity is, I don't know. God is absolute and man isn't. Divine vocary, vocabulary gives exact, watch this now, divine gives exact reality or absolutes to the thing named. That's an absolute. God is light. That's an absolute. And there's no, that's an absolute. I'm born in the domain of darkness. That's an absolute. I am transferred. I am rescued and transferred out of there into the kingdom. That's an absolute. You know why? Because the word of God says so. When God speaks it, it's absolute. Well, it's not going to say, well, maybe he won, maybe he won. Right? Divine vocabulary is an absolute. It gives exact reality to the thing named. That's why you ought to study the Bible, dear hearts. And to the believer, it becomes his base of operation by faith. 
That's Romans 4.21. It is different, listen to me now, it, this is different than human vocabulary that expresses the impression made upon one's mind by personal attachment to the object, such as a pet or a doll. Right? Why do you call your dog what you call him? You, you know, little kids, I mean, what little girl doesn't have a doll? I bet you remember a doll you had when you were a kid that, that you named. That's, you still remember that doll. They can recall the name because of a personal emotional attachment. That's not, that's not how God.